Good morning. Ten minutes after six on the Norm Kent Show. Obli di obli da. Life goes on. That was the Beatles from the White Album, the song that I wanted to play for you yesterday to begin the show, and I wound up doing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" because Bill Gardner was still talking about football even today. I heard him talking about football. And of course, it will be a long winter for Scotty Norwood and the Buffalo Bills. But Jim Kelly just didn't seem to care enough. You know, he didn't have what it took. His heart wasn't in the game. And they lost. And the Giants won. So that makes two wins for the Giants, two for the 49ers in the last five years. But remember last year, what happened to the, the last year the Giants won the Super Bowl, what happened to them? immediately thereafter. Do you remember that? They, they were like started off the year losing to the Bears and the 49ers and, and then to the Los Angeles Clippers and to the New York uh, you know, Nets. So basically they got beat by everybody. They started off like 0-5. Then a high school team from Seattle came and beat them. They were 0-6. And, and everybody was saying, sure, they're spoiled. Bill Parcells says that won't happen this year. Nuke Iran is what I say. They're SOBs. I warned people from the start. I said, hey, don't trust these Iranians. They're going to go to bed with the Arabs. What's that Arabic saying? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my brother is my enemy. Well, anyway, about 80 United States... Uh, now, now, it's not 80 Iraqi planes are now in Iran. Now, if we're doing such a good job, folks, if we're doing such a good job, uh, protecting this air superiority. Remember this trip? We have complete air superiority over Iraq. Nothing can escape us. That now, I mean, they said that in English, British, Saudi Arabian, American. Everybody said it in the past week. You've heard every single commander say it. In the meantime, 80 Iraqi planes have escaped Iraq and gone to Iran, where they're obviously one day going to launch a massive military strike directly against the United States forces in the Persian Gulf or against the United States uh, aircraft on the high seas. And they'll probably be loaded with chemical weapons when they do, and uh, we'll be screwed because we're playing, you know, fair. We're actually saying to the public that Iran will remain neutral. Yeah. They'll remain neutral. Right. They'll remain neutral, and uh, who was that football player? Jack Lambert? will never engage in a bad hit. This is the Norm Kent Show, 12 minutes after 6 on, uh, on what time is it? Uh, what day is it? Tuesday, 29th of January. Now, I have to tell you, you're going to get a kick out of this, all those of you that follow me this early in the morning and have dealt with the incredible stress I deal with coming in through the, you know, barbed wire fencing and uh, armed encampment that the uh, WFTL headquarters is in this, you know, wonderful neighborhood. I lost the gate card they gave me Friday. I found it Friday night. Um, so I had no sweat because I found it. But then by the weekend, it was gone. And yesterday when I got here, no gate card. So Jim Michaels, our operation manager, says, well, that's Norm. You know, he can't, you know, hold on to his hats. You know, I got like 20 of my baseball caps around this studio because I'm always losing them. And then, of course, Craig Worthing, yeah, Craig Worthing takes it home with him. But uh, I got to the gate today. I had put my gate card right in the console of my Lexus, so I knew it would be there. And faithfully, folks, it was there. So I take out my gate card, my trusty gate card, and I put it up against the metallic window which is supposed to read against this piece of plastic. Hi, this is the Norm Kent gate card. You're allowed in this sucker of a place. Okay, no problem, Norm. We're going to just, you know, electronically open this gate. It's going to slide back on its wheels. You're going to be able to pull Alexis up. You're going to be able to drive right in. It's going to be a can of corn. Don't worry. Don't sweat it. You'll have no problem at all. It will be a sweet bird of paradise morning for you. 6.15 on FTL. Now... I am rubbing my plastic gate card. We'll get to your calls in a second. I am running my plastic gate card against this metal window like a guy.
guy massaging a girl's chest for the first time. You know, first I start off real gentle. I'm rubbing it nice and simple. Okay. Nothing happens. The gate does not open. So I, you know, just a little bit faster. Nothing happens. The gate does not open. So I take this gate card that I have. And I say, well, maybe I just, maybe it's a little dirty, you know. So I take it into my car and get a tissue and I rub it a little and clean it off. Turn it upside down. Put it up against this little green light and rub it against the metal window. And I'm rubbing and I'm rubbing and nothing is happening. Which has, you know, happened to many of us many times in our lives, right? However, however, um, I like that one. So anyway, I can't get in. I still can't get in. I've got my gate card. Um, now I'm ready to smash this stupid machine in. Because it's now, I mean, we're, I'm doing this for like seven minutes because I don't want to accept that I can't get in because I have my gate card. And I mean, it's a fancy plastic gate card with blue stripes going vertically and diagonally. And it's supposed to be reading to this machine, hi, this is the Norm Kent gate card, but I still can't get in this damn place. I was going to turn around and go home and be like Howard Cassell who broadcasts from his uh, Connecticut home every morning at 848. You know, hello again, everybody. This is Howard Cosell speaking of sports. Today, Muhammad Ali knocked out Joe Frazier in the thriller from Manila, right? So I was going to do that, you know. But I did get in, and hey, it's okay because it gave me 17 minutes of a routine. Speaking of uh, routines, at 17 minutes after 6 on a Tuesday morning, where the hell is Sean Toner? <laughs> hey, what about that for timing? What about that for timing? Is this Sean? Yes, it is. Well, your timing was incredibly perfect this morning. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Good morning to you. Good morning, a man who works 30 hours a day. What I know. You I, know hope, I hope you get paid for it. <laughs> yeah, one way or another, I'll get my way. Say, what a foggy morning, too, this morning. You notice that getting up? Yeah, you know, I noticed that getting up. My dogs noticed it. The uh, homeless guy sleeping in the park said it was uh, very foggy last night. Indeed it was, and uh, mostly in the western quadrants right now, both Dade and Brown, in Paso and Palm Beach County as well. The road is not looking pretty good so far this morning. Well, because nobody's up yet except us sick people. Just you and I. And this update brought to you by those friendly folks at Broward County Transit. That's another way to get around today is by the bus, because uh, 95 moving very well. Let a road work, though, again. I say norm these days, it seems more difficult to get to the interstate than to drive on the interstate. So the construction of the ramps taking you to and from 95. And so far, no accidents have been spotted. And why pay high prices for gas? Risk fender benders and a nervous breakdown in traffic. Relax, enjoy, and take Broward County Transit to work, shopping, or play. Call BCC at 357-8400. I'm Sean Toner, WSTL Traffic. Okay, Sean. Be careful. Well, folks, what can I tell you? 17 minutes after 6, it's occurred to me that bosses, employers, they never have to worry about things like fog because by the time they get up and get to the office, the sun is shining, the coffee's already brewed, the kitchen is clean, and Ed is on line one. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Okay. I have a legal question for you. Oh, really? <laughs> I need Give me a break. <laughs> somebody be... I'm only taking legal questions between 6 and 6.30 every morning. So. Okay. Can somebody be denied employment because they filed two personal bankruptcy last year? If they're in sales, if it's a sales job. Well, unfortunately, the... State of Florida, as I pointed out in a number of times in a number of issues, has no right to employment law. So you can be denied employment or fired from employment for just about any reason in the world, provided A, that you're not a state employee, B, that you don't have a contract, or C, the discrimination is not based on age, sex, or race. So uh, and this came up yesterday. We were talking about the ACLU challenging the Miami Beach law that will provide for individuals who are arrested with drug offenses to have their employers notified by the police agency, which is a little bit absurd because if persons get acquitted, if the person gets off scot-free, uh, he can still have lost his job because the employer was notified that he was arrested on a drug offense. And you can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about it. So when you ask that question, since an employer has a right to uh, hire you, he ha has a right to not hire you. So if he finds out that you've declared bankruptcy, and elects as a result of that decision not to hire you, there's very little you can do about it. 
Discrimination based on wealth is not a classification which the government uh, has found to be offensive. Yeah, because going to the court of bankruptcy, it's yeah, uh, a court thing that you're protected, and it's just a formality to go through, and uh, it shouldn't have anything to do with uh, your job. Yeah, well, my law practice stays the way it is. Since I came on the radio, I'll be right there with you. But uh, the... Uh, so what would happen if you're in a state that, that uh, you'd have a little bit more protection? Well, that, that's it. I mean, it, it, Florida is just one of those states. I'll tell you a great case I did about 10 years ago. It was a young man. I'll be on the radio because I'm at a pay phone. I've got to go to work. Okay, well, you can listen on the radio. I will. Thank you. All right. A great case I did about 10 years ago was uh, involving a young man who was a uh, scuba diver and lived in Coral Springs with me up in the beginning. And he was employed by a company that uh, had him doing diving at John Pennekamp State Park in Key Largo which is where we would occasionally go scuba diving near the reef, where there's a wealth and collection of incredible, beautiful, multicolored tropical fish that really exemplifies the uh, just gorgeous dimension that the Keys are. And the employer told him to get some coral off the reef, and he said no. He said it's illegal, it's a crime to take coral, live coral, out of the reef, especially off a state park, like John Pennekamp State Park. So this young man was fired by his firm because he refused to take live coral out of the reef. And he sued. He said, hey, you can't fire me for not committing an illegal act. And the Court of Appeals, which is where it went to, ruled against him. They said, hey, Florida is not a right to employment state. People can be fired for whatever reason they want to be as long as it's not discrimination based on age, sex, or race. So here's a young man who refused to commit a criminal act and was fired from his job, and that firing was upheld by a divided Supreme Court saying that although we would prefer not to fire this person, or not to uphold this firing, we have no choice because, you know, courts only have a duty to enforce the law, not interpret the law. You've heard this in a more uh, amplified way on national debates about Supreme Court powers with guys like uh, Bobby Bork and David Souter when they talk about being strict constructionists. Well, a strict constructionist looks at the letter of law. So if uh, under the law somebody walks in in Broward County and says, I'd like to, you know, hold this job, you know, I'm a gay man, and he gets fired. That's tough, because Florida, Broward County last year did not vote in favor of a gay rights bill. They voted against it. So had they voted for it, it would have been illegal to fire somebody who was gay. But now if an employer finds out you're gay and he doesn't like you, he has the right to fire you in Broward County. Um, now let's say, suppose somebody comes in and says, uh, well, I'm handicapped, I'm in a wheelchair, and they fire you. And they say they fire you because they don't want anybody with wheelchairs going around their building. Well, then that employer would be in a lot of trouble because that's discrimination against someone who is handicapped. And you can't discriminate against somebody who is handicapped. That would be against the law. Now, let's use a third sample. Somebody comes in, and he's a real hippie-looking dude, and he's doing the job real well, but, you know, he freaks out on acid, and he does a little bit of ecstasy, and he's tripping out on lewds and, you know, he's doing a lot of drugs and he grows his hair real long and the employer says, look, I don't care how good you are, as a talk show host, I, I want you to cut your hair. And you go, hey, cutting my hair is not a job related thing. The only question is whether I'm dynamite as a talk show host. And they go, yeah, you're dynamite as a talk show host, but I want your hair short because I don't want your lights getting into the earphones that other talk show hosts use. And the talk show host says, hey, I ain't cutting my hair, dude, employer. And then the dude employer says, you're fired. There's nothing he can do about it because you have a right to be fired if you have long hair because unless you have a written contract that protects your right to work, Florida is not a right to work state. So the next time your legislator is running for office, you know, and saying how, you, let's take Carrie Kino, okay? Let's start ripping these local politicians. I think it's about time, right? I've been on the air a month and, you know, I've been telling political jokes and very soon we'll, we will be electing them all. Harry Kino is one of the four Kino brothers running for city commission. Carry is going to be setting up a district office at 2000 East Sunrise Boulevard when elected. 
Carrie ran against Sheila Harrigan about four years ago and came within 66 votes of a victory. And Carrie is a dedicated, young, potential public servant. And I have no doubt that he will work very hard at working very hard. But here is the guy that exemplifies the very worst in what American politics is today. Now, by that, I don't mean Carrie Kino is the very worst. I mean, the way his campaign is being conducted is a classic example of media manipulation. Now, Carrie indicated back in Thanksgiving time that he was running for office, and therefore he engaged in a media blitz. The first thing I did living in his district, I got a Thanksgiving card. Oh, wait, no, back sh before Thanksgiving, he talked at Labor Day, he sent out an announcement that he's going to be running for city commission in February. So the first thing I did at my residence was I got a birthday card in the middle of October from Carrie Kino saying, hi, this is Carrie Kino, candidate for city commission. I just want to wish you a happy birthday. Then about a month later, I got another postcard from Carrie Kino. This one wished me a happy Thanksgiving. Then about four weeks after that, sure enough, you guessed it, I got a Christmas card from Carrie Kino wishing me a Merry Christmas. If that weren't enough, I think I got a New Year's card a week later. Now this guy has already, you know, now that I know his position on my birthday, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, what the hell does this guy have to say about any issue in the world, right? So the next thing I do, the first week of January, Carrie, who's riding around town on his bicycle, I'm waiting for somebody to just knock him off, and okay, maybe I'll get a case out of it. The next thing I know is Carrie sends out a poll to ask our opinion on the issues. Because as soon as he gets back the poll, you know, he'll know which way the wind is blowing, and that's the position he'll take. In other words, what the hell does Carrie think on any issue? We don't know. We're going to give Carrie a poll, and then Carrie will maybe come back and tell us what his position is after reading our poll. Well, you see, I don't think when you're a public official or a leader, you have the right or you have the ability to tap the public conscience at any moment. You have to have a little bit of a conscience of your own. You can't have a complete vacuum in there. You have to have the ability to anticipate or guess what the good and just and proper thing to do is. And you don't have time to do a poll or ride your bicycle all over the city. You have to let people know what your position is on the issues. If there are any issues in the city of Fort Lauderdale other than the hallelujah chorus stopping anybody from dancing naked and drinking alcohol at the same time. So let me catch my breath here and not get too angry. The, the next thing I know is I get this poll from Karen. So I, I'm just wondering whether he's going to send me a Valentine's Day card, too, because let's, he is kind of cute, and he does have three brothers, and they've all been hanging out together. And I don't know if any of them are married, so you take it from there. 6.28 a.m. on WFTL. Carrie does have the endorsement of the PBA, the uh, Police Benevolent Association, I think, or the Fraternal Order of Police, or the... Uh, you know, the fundraising arm of the police department that walks around so we can pay money for them to play in a pig bowl on Fridays and get, you know, double overtime from the sheriff at the same time, which is something that, let's hope, Nick gets indicted for. Can you imagine this? They're playing football, and they're getting paid $21 an hour by your taxes to play in a football game. And, and think about the fact that they brought, like, 100 cops for four hours to that game. That means the football game that the Broward Sheriff's Office played against the Fort Lauderdale Police cost the taxpayers about $8,500, not including the equipment and uh, the payouts these guys got. Well, that's okay. You know, we've got to have sports in the department. So, uh, Carikino could be a great commissioner because here's a guy that has done more for the race than anybody else. You see, the flip side, there's always like a positive side to the negative side. You know, there's a yin and a yang uh, for every action. There's an equal reaction. Well, nobody else is running like he is. I mean, here's a guy who obviously wants to be a city commissioner. It's not just that he lost by 66 votes two years ago. He has not missed a single city commission meeting in the two or three years since that last election. He has done more for uh, a candidacy for this office than anybody can imagine because he has kept the faith. You know, he's... He's been there. He's, he's become intimately acquainted with the way the cities run, how it's managed, who's voted what way. We may have no idea how he will vote, but we know that he is not going to be missing any meetings to, you know, go golfing or, you know, s selling boats in St. John's like uh, Bob Cox.
No one can't at 6.30. Let's break for the CNN News, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the city commission race in Fort Lauderdale, and I'll analyze some of the other candidates for you. It should be a lot of fun. Go wake them up right now, and uh, let's see what I say. I'll see how close I can come to slander on the air. Yeah. CNN Radio for the Gold Coast. WFTL, Fort Lauderdale. And, of course, it's a pleasure to welcome Kendall Toyota to the Norm Kent family of sponsors. Okay, Norm Kent, welcoming uh, Kendall Toyota to my family of sponsors. 6.35 a.m. here on The Big F, yeah, WFTL. We've got Sean Tona with the traffic update. Let's go to the early morning roadways. Now, Sean, do you see Carrie, uh, Carrie Kino out there on his bicycle? I saw something go by on a bicycle about 25 miles an hour, about a half an hour ago. It's probably Carrie campaigning for votes. I disappeared into the box. Bicycling for his future. You got it, kid. Okay, Sean, and watch out for Carrie on his bicycle. Now, who else is running in that race? There's, there's Joe Hessman. He'd be like Captain Tony in Key West electing Joe. No telling what would happen to the government if Joe became an officer because it would be in for a shock. It would be like uh, coming out of a uh, hot sauna in a Catskill Mountain hotel and jumping into the cold snow. That's what Joe Hessman would be like. Laura Ward, I don't know. Uh, she, she apparently has uh, problems with her residency. She's bouncing back and forth between here and Pompano in deciding where to live and which city commission to run for. Maybe she can run for both. There's Sheila Harrigan. Now, whenever I run into Sheila, she's like, uh, you know, in a restaurant with some fancy bigwig eating dinner, which means that she's learned the fine art of running government. And there's about 18 other people running for uh, city commission in District 2, including my, I think my grandmother was so excited about the race, she came out of the grave just to, you know, put her name on the candidacy. And then there's this guy, Dr. Joe Smith, you know, who's changed his first name legally to Dr., and is so disgraced as a result of the same that uh, you cannot uh, get him invited to a public meeting. Talk about being a whore, Dr. Joe Smith. Hi, Norm Kent on FTL. Hi, I'd like to ask you something. I don't know, I have a TV that calls a lot like this station. But I was wondering if this is a broad military action versus secret battle between the Saudi and the I can't hear you, sir. The close to a million uh, mines, or so I'd say 14 million mines in the Middle East and Kuwait and Iraq, and the, uh, the transfer of missiles from Jordan to Iraq and other little phenomena that no one seems to be talking we, about. We have had an incredible wealth of military experts on our station. We've had Admiral Singlaub. We've had calls to the commander-in-chief of... Uh, the ground forces in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, live phone calls. We spent uh, thousands and dollars, thousands of dollars on up-to-date CNN coverage. So, uh, if you're asking me what each of them have said, I could not summarize the the past month of our coverage. Not, not CNN coverage. I need to get you. That's know. what I'm talking about. I'm I'm talking about people that have come into our studio. We had somebody on Steve Kane's show that was one of the chief military advisors to uh, Ronald Reagan's administration uh, here this week, last past Friday. No, I, I did hear that, but I don't remember anybody mentioning the material that I mentioned. About missiles being stored on the Jordanian border? Uh -huh. Well, I, I don't know whether that's come up. We've, you know, we've done about uh, 200 hours of programming on the, oh, yeah. on the war in the Gulf. I just don't know whether anyone's talked about that. What do you know about it? What do you want to tell us about it? Well, I just heard there was a report. I think it was, I think it was yesterday when they had the briefing. 10 o'clock. And I think it was yesterday when they had the briefing. And the R, the National Climate Agency, was being stored in Georgia and being transported across the border. And no one is saying anything about it. Okay, well, I don't know. I'll pay attention to it. Uh, All right? And also the fact that he's laid the place with mine. Well, that we know. Supposedly over one million mines. hundred years from now, some shepherd with a camel is going to get blown to kingdom come. Allah be great. All because of Saddam Hussein in 1990. I think we don't seem to understand is that the man is actually a hero in the Arab world. Oh, he's no hero. Don't believe that. Don't fall for that Palestinian lie that he's mobilizing the Arabic world. This isn't any Arab Masada here. The population of demonstrating. That's how bad. 
all the way to North Africa. The man is considered a hero. Well, that's great. Okay, so he's a mass murderer. He's committing genocide against the environment. He's con committing genocide against the population. He's mining the uh, Arab Arabian oil fields. He's destroying their own world, and he's considered a hero. That tells you how sick some of those people are, doesn't it? Let's put it this way. Uh, that may be fine. You can label them sick, but they're out to win, unfortunately. And I think... Oh, and we're out to lose. We're going to send people over there just to get our asses kicked, right? Well, let me put it this way. I hope a lot of these are planned for military conditions. All I know is that apparently at 80 percent, what we have been told, that means 20 percent of all those bombing sites are probably hit. We still do not even have 25 percent of those launchers hit. They have about, supposedly about 38, we only have about eight. That is over two weeks of bombing. That's not very good. It's 8 percent more or 38 percent more than we had two weeks ago, though, right? Right? Out of 38 is not very good. But but it's still more than, than they had two weeks ago, right? So if we keep it up for about six months, they won't be going anywhere. They're no longer going to be a military threat. Let me put it this way, Norm. Why does it take that level of, of bombing at level? I mean, there's something seriously wrong. Going well, you're, you're making a judgment sitting here on uh, the beach in Florida of what the effectiveness of our military operation has been so far. And you're fooling yourself, just as you can't believe each and everything these military briefings tell you, you're fooling yourself if you think you know any more than I do or anyone else does. You know, there's a lot of it that seems to be uh, information that basically what we are being told is probably some of the conspiracy theories that are being put out there. Uh, and I'm not sure I agree. Well, I don't know. I, military uh, briefings, I've said all week, I've said all month, the first casualty of war is truth, and you can't expect the military to be uh, briefing you knowing that Saddam Hussein is watching uh, what's going on. I mean, one of these reporters actually said yesterday, uh, he actually asked, uh, when will we be engaging the ground forces? And Schwarzkopf looked at him and shook his head in disbelief. He said, well, I think that's something I'll hold back on answering. In those kinds of questions, but the bottom line is they're not allowed free reign well, what would you do? You've got, you know, this is like the Super Bowl. You've got 700 reporters there. What are we going to do? Make them into a combat infantry unit? Well, so far, so far, all you have done, this is about the fifth, you keep on shifting the topic, and, and you're coming up with a criticism. You tell me what you would do with 700 reporters in the Persian Gulf in a war. We haven't engaged any. We haven't engaged any adversary yet. That's 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 a canard because basically they're not even allowed to talk to the troops. Only selected individuals. Let's put this way: the campaign is probably is tightly run. Trying to talk to the Soviet military five years ago and ask the Soviet soldiers. We know that. That that doesn't surprise us. What what the hell has that got to do with anything Saddam Hussein has done? What what's your point? I agree that the press is not being given free reign in the Middle East. So what? What do you mean we we have no choice? They're complaining. People are editorializing about it. People are writing about it. People are making uh, commentators are talking about it on the air, and a lot of people are angry about the ability of the press to effectively cover the war. But what's your point? So what? That, is that a reason to pull out our troops? Should we just leave because the press isn't given proper coverage? Okay, I'll expect five to ten thousand casualties uh, because you say so. Thanks for your call. This is Norm Kent. We'll be back after an update from the Persian Gulf at 6:45. The weather today continued foggy until early in the morning, then mostly sunny and warm. High in the mid to upper 80s. Wind south, 10 miles per hour. Mostly flare tonight. Low in the lower 70s. Wind south.
12 minutes to uh, 7 a.m. And this is the Norm Kent Show here on WFTL, the Big F. Yeah, let's go to traffic with the Big S. Okay, let's see. We've got 10 minutes to 7 a.m. My computer screen is, uh, you know, history. And my voice is not coming out in my ear correctly, but I've got to straighten that out. No problem. Let's see. We've got a call on line uh, two. It's Mel. Oh. Yeah. Morning. How are you? Uh, fine. You want to get aggravated. I just saw in the Sun Central this morning a section that says don't tie yellow ribbons on. Uh, in Northridge Hospital, they said that the employees are not allowed to tie yellow ribbons on their uh, uniforms. It said it would violate the hospital dress code and could offend someone's political point of view. Hospital officials said. Out of the five hospitals, Northridge was the only one that came up with that ruling. Well, it, it takes a certain amount of jerks to run a hospital to come up with that kind of ruling. But think now, the political point of view, uh, is everybody behind the, the boys or not? It would make it such a thing like that. You know, even the people that say they oppose the conflict say they support the warriors, if not the war. And if you can't wear a yellow ribbon, which has become synonymous with support for hostages or troops overseas or a loved one in a stress situation, uh, what the hell can you do? Now, going back to what I said at 6 o'clock, if you're to believe this concept of the right to be fired at will for something unjustly, then people who wear this yellow ribbon would be construed to be making a political statement and be fired for it. Well, it says different cut yellow what, what, what are you reading from? What page? Sun Sentinel on the front page. I would think it says different colored yellow ribbons. I understand yellow is yellow. How many colors can yellow be? There were a bunch of Maybe we ought to take a blindfold and put it up uh, across the eyes of the Northridge Hospital directors. Yeah, yeah. Let me read this with you. Yeah. Patriotism is tied up in red tape at Northridge Medical Center where employees have been ordered not to wear yellow ribbons to work. Ribbons would violate the hospital dress code and could offend someone's political point of view. What? Are they, are they kidding? I guess political free speech doesn't apply to the Northridge Hospital District. You know, as an old saying, you're either with me or against me. If, you, if you're not with me, I know a lot of this. There is a lot of sentiment uh, for the Arabs because you run across a couple of Arab people in the, uh, in, in, you know, the area. Oh, that, right. There's a lot of Arab people in the hospital that are getting American jobs and American education. Absolutely. Absolutely. Learning how to use American chemical weapons, huh? They call our welfare and everything and all our benefits, and then they're going to beat their chest for everything, you know? Do you believe this? Yeah. They're going to put up one big yellow ribbon in the hallway. Right, right. Oh, that's like, you know, whenever they... I always wondered about, you know, flea collars for dogs, how you can wear, like, something around his neck and it's not going to, you know, he's not going to get any fleas on his tail. The reason I point that out is, is because it's kind of like... I, I would not wear something around my neck to stay clean. Well, but what we need to do is get a flea collar for the neck of this guy, uh, Don Stegman. Let's call him up. I'm gonna hang, I'm gonna see if we can get a hold of Don Stegman. I'll see you, Don. I gotta go to work. You go to work, and I'm gonna get a hold of Don Stegman between the seven and eight hour. I'm gonna call him up and ask right. him to identify this. Good. And find out what color yellow comes in. Yes. Well, you know, you know why they say they can't wear yellow ribbon. You know what color yellow means? That's right. It's the, the yellow is the spineless color of the hospital. Well, I can understand it says about the uh, psychiatric ward that a red would is infurator, but uh, red, yellow is a uh, peaceful color. Soothing to the eye when you look at it, it has no aggravation. Unbelievable. Un you know who says that? Yeah, yeah. My friend down the street. Right. Unbelievable. And, and, you know, that's why he was able to come up. That's why Neil came up with the phrase, unbelievable. These things could only happen. Could only happen. Let's, let's try something here. Uh, yes, in Fort Lauderdale, the Northridge Medical Center. Uh, with the hospital administrator. Okay, they don't say that looks the same. you want the main number? Yes, that will be fine. The number is seven seven six six thousand. Okay. 
that's about five to seven here on FTL. We call up the North Ridge Hospital Medical Center. They're too, nobody's answering the phone. They're too busy taking down yellow ribbons. Hello. Yes, is this the North Ridge Medical Center? Hello. Yes, uh, is Don Stigman in to work yet? Uh, the hospital administrator. Mr. Stigman comes in at eight. At eight. Right. You, could you have him call me, please? Who is that? Uh, Norm Kent, K-E-N-T, uh -huh. on WFTL Radio. Uh -huh. And uh, he can call me uh, at 733-1400. Uh, It's in reference to his uh, repressive, ugly, disgusting policy that hospital employees can't wear yellow ribbons. Okay, great. I'll give him the message. Oh, you you uh, will do that, won't you? Yes, I will. 8 a.m. he gets there. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Oh, we're going to give it to Don Stigman, right, Gigi? Yes, really. Oh, really. Yeah. Oh, wait till he calls back. <laughs> Stig well, how did, what did he pronounce his name? Stigman? Is that what he said? I think so. Correct. Was it Ehrlichman, Eichmann, or Steigman? I forget. Okay, I think it was Eichmann. Okay. <laughs> I think you might have hit upon it, too, by saying Do there's a lot of Arabs in the hospital, and that's what they're worried about sending, not the patients. So we'll, uh, we'll, Doctors. we'll put it some, we'll mix the rib, we'll put a little brown rib. You know, just a ribbon, and how about a, a, your red, white, and blue ribbon? Would that be okay? Well, I don't understand that if the individual people are not allowed to wear, why are they putting one in the hall? Isn't the one in the hall going to be... Uh, offensive. If they think an individual ribbon is offensive, why is not the one in the hall going to be offensive? We, all people need to do is... Now, now, women have brooches, right? You, My mom used to wear lots of brooches on dresses, little pins and things. Right. So maybe we can just make a yellow ribbon into a brooch and make it part of the outfit. Well, I wanted to mention that Cypress Humana Hospital in Pompano, and that's the round hospital. Yes. They have a giant yellow ribbon painted directly on the hospital on both sides so you can see it from 95 and you can see it coming from Pompano and it's been up there quite a while and I must commend them for that. They decided to make a statement. Well, hopefully people will. You know, Neil, we've been talking about it. I've been urging people to drive with their headlights on. And, and the only reason I ask that, I know it's just a, a token thing, but it makes people conscious of the fact that uh, we're at war. And, and, and men are dying, and women are dying that are I fighting for our flags. freedoms. I've been seeing a lot of flags on cars. Yeah, I know. We've, I, uh, my friend Ronnie McCarthy on uh, East Las Olas, she's got a little uh, stand there, and uh, she sells now little American flags that people are putting on their um, antennas. You know, with the new cars, unlike cars 20 years ago, the antennas go down as soon as the uh, vehicle is shut off. You know, the antenna recesses into the trunk or something, so you can't put uh, flags on antennas anymore because the, the flag would fall off the moment the antenna went down or the car was shut off. That's all right. an old car like mine. Unless you have a real old car, right, and, and then you're okay. Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> but, the, but those newer cars, you know, we've got to stop crime, so the antennas kind of get hidden, which is fine until you break the antenna, and then you find out your electrical antenna costs $190 to fix, so you're better off with yours. You have to start carrying your transistor in the car. Right. Well, I don't care what people do to, su you know, support the, the the forces there, but we need to do something. Well, I'm, I'm so disappointed at Northridge uh, Hospital. It's a fine hospital. I'm just uh, very disappointed at this childish uh, remark. Plus, like I said, if they thoroughly believe the statement they made, then it was, should be like no ribbons anywhere, right? Well, if you made right. a statement that you didn't believe in something, then it would be carte blanche. Nobody wore it. So why are they putting it in the hall? Well, don't worry. I'll be attacking them for the next three hours of my show. Yeah, that's if he calls. I doubt the man would... Oh, I'm, I'm going to call him. <laughs> I'm going to call him directly. Go get him, Norm. Okay. We love it. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Norm Kent here on the Big F WFTL. I see we got Mike. We got Jack. We got Cracker Jack. And we got Mike the Spike. And they're going to have to wait till after the 7 a.m. news because... We're just cooking here this morning on the Big F. Yeah. I told you last night would be MC Hammer Night. It was the man without a shirt and an incredible body and dark sunglasses and ribbons around his own neck won five medals at the American Music Awards. Read last night again Gene P. Sasson's book, The Rape of Kuwait. If you can get it, I understand that and the Saddam Hussein story will be available at the uh, bookstop this week. We'll be back. We've got lots of people waiting to talk to me with good reason and good cause here on the Big F. 
WFTL, this is the Norm Kent Show, and I'll be back after the 7 a.m. news. Yeah. I'm on the 29th of January, a Tuesday. And this is the 7 to 8 hour. I think we've had a good first hour. And I think one of the reasons we've had a good first hour is because a caller inspired me and turned my direction towards the front page article in the Sun Sentinel saying how the Northridge Hospital Medical Center will not allow individuals to wear little yellow ribbons on their clothing because they want a uniform policy in the hospital. Uh, it takes a special creed of people to come up with things that prevent people from expressing themselves in a time of war. Let's see, Mike, you've waded through the news, so I know you have an incredible contribution to the Norm Kent Show. Oh, this is Jack, that's right. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry. No You're right, I, I see, line three, Jack. How about Wait a second, that's what uh, McGovern said about Eagleton. Well, let's put it this way. Let, no, you're, no, wait, you're, you're really getting off base. Iran lost a half million people in the war. Iraq clearly used the war as an opportunity to suck out of the West incredible militaristic development so that Hussein could do the things he has done. During the war, he, he spent millions of dollars on modern chemical production equipment that he got from the West. Tons and tons of chemical warfare agents were used. It was, and he used it early in the war, from the beginning of the war right until uh, 1984. Well, I, Iran reported ca chemical casualties. Nobody, nobody believed Iran until in uh, early 1984, Iran started sending chemical casualties to Vienna and London and Stockholm and Tokyo and saw the devastating weapons that, that Hussein was using. That's what I mean, he knew what kind of madman he was. He saw, but in a holy war, when you had a man like Khomeini, when you had a man like Hussein, who knows what their thinking is. You see, they're on a different thinking level than you or I. They may feel uh, to sacrifice for a holy war these people, or whatever the reason is. Don't you think they're in collusion now with these planes. And what happens when they put their army in, in Iran? I, I mean, you, you got to, this, this whole thing, and they're playing the chess game without rules. And I'm, I mean, here's what's bothering me more than anything. 
I mean, I support my country, I support the president, I made it so that they tried one year behind our back in Vietnam. But at the other side of the coin, I got three, three boys, and so far none of my boys have been up at the front. If they were at the front, I would be scared stiff, and I don't think that my boys should be fodder for a war to be fought with while we have our hands clean, and that man has his hands dirty, and my children should die because we refuse to change our tactics. It's, it's, not, it's an unfair war, and it's unfair for these men at the, at the, at the front. That's really what, what, what I, that's the, the thing I'm against. I'm not against anything else other than the method of which we are fighting in this war is going to be Vietnam all over again. They're going to have their men on the other side of the Iranian border. They're going to have their planes there. And we can't go because we'll send the Iranians. I, I'll tell you, you, you've touched upon a point that angered me from the moment I started this show. It's 6 a.m. this morning. I think it's outrageous. It's incredible. These military experts got up there and bragged about how we have air superiority over Iraq, that we completely control the airspace. And then they say 80 Iraqi planes have escaped to Iran. Well, then they're liars. We don't have control over the airspace. And we should interdict those planes. And if those planes landed at the Iranian airport, then bomb the hell out of the Iranian airport and worry about it later. Because if you don't believe that those planes and those aircraft and those pilots are in collusion with the Iranians, then we're stupid idiots. Well, that's exactly what I'm getting at. You see, we're worried about... Uh, Screw the public opinion. Win the war. We'll worry about it later. And you, you, you see, you just hit it on the head. Public opinion, we have to keep our hands clean. Public opinion will be won if we win the war quickly, decisively, with a minimum of casualty. And even if there's a big casualty, America will take it if we win. Well, but if we, if we keep on allowing Israel to be hit by missiles, if we allow Ar Iraqis to treat prisoners of war improperly, if we keep civilian targets off base, if we say Iran is neutral and we're not going to do anything there, then we're stupid idiots. I've got to go to a break. You want to hold on? I All right, hold on. This is a very angry Norm Kent at 7.15. Let me catch my breath and take a break with Herschel Gordon Lewis and the rest, and I'll come back with a wealth of callers. Yuri, Jack, Dennis, hang on. Hey, doesn't anybody remember what happened? Israel didn't attack another country. In 1967, the Arabs attacked. Israel occupied the West Bank only after fighting them off. Then, Israel accepted two United Nations resolutions calling for a trade of land for peace. The Arab countries were the ones who rejected the resolutions. Maybe we've forgotten how the United States grabbed land after the Spanish-American War. None of us was around when that war took place, but I can't fathom how so many people don't ask why some of the Arab countries don't offer the Palestinians some land. Now, I guess the blind don't want to see. Asking for separate countries isn't new. Why do you think we fought the Civil War? It wasn't over slavery. It was over the right of states to secede from the Union. If you're from Canada, you know what's going on there. The French-speaking province wants to be its own country. You can't say no to that and yes to the Palestinians. You know what would make the most sense? Get all these countries together, have them agree to mediation by the one person who can straighten out the whole international political situation just by pointing out all those mistakes others make. Your curmudgeon at large, Herschel, Gordon, Lewis. Here we are going to go to um, Sean Traffic and then back to the Sports. I'm not doing, I'm not going to do the sports. Cook Tableside, by the way, by Nunzio, and Nunzio's Ron Beirut. What a host. I said I'm not going to do the sports. Located on Oakland oh, okay. Boulevard and Federal Highway, right behind Hale's Piano, that's Nunzio's from Bay Room. Tell him Herschel Gordon Lewis and Steve Kane. Send you a call 563-7455 for reservation. 18 minutes after 7 a.m. on the Norm Kent Show, and we've got the lines pounding away with hopefully the same level of anger I have at what I've been reading in the newspaper today about Hussein's comments and Northridge Medical Director's position, but first, uh, the reality of uh, my opening song, Life Goes On, from the Beatles, is best told by Sean Tona, who tells us life about roadways. 
And anybody wondering where I am now on this uh, microphone is I can't hear my self think again. What's going on here? Okay, anyway, we've got a bunch of calls. It's 20 minutes after 7, and uh, let's go to some of those calls. Let's see. We've got uh, Jack was holding, right? Jack, we'll come back to you for a minute. All right, Norman. All I'm just saying is that if my president does not cherish every life, every man's life on the, on the front, and that allows something to get sucked into a land war with this, with this man and fight him every way and out of the way, but it's blasting the people, as he, as he, if he's doing just as bad work by doing that with the oil, or using any kind of uh, a weapons necessary and not care about trying to keep the coalition together. Because the coalition is a bunch of snakes, and you just can't hold on to them. L listen, I, I agree with you. That's you know, put, let's put somebody on the phone that disagrees with us, okay? Okay. All right. It's uh, 20 minutes after 7, and we would normally go to CNN Sports, but I think your callers are... Uh, your calls are more important than the sports, so basically all you need to know is that the Pistons won again, the Celtics won again, you know, Atlanta lost, the Knicks lost, San Antonio won, the running Rebels, whoa, whoa, sorry about that, the running Rebels, they keep on winning, 126-83 over Utah State, and you know the Norm Kent position, there is no sports until the baseball season starts, but let's see what Dennis has to say on line one. Good. Okay, well, you're on the air. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Uh, I guess you picked the wrong one because you can't get me to disagree. But what I want you to say is... Well, you know what? Very few of us disagree, but we're all frustrated, so we're kind of each ventilating our anger. That's about right. You know, it seems like we're talking about a war with limited casualties. Well, George Bush is going to have to decide which casualties to limit. It's either going to be ours or theirs, and unless we use nukes on the Revolutionary Guard or maybe to clear the, clear the minefields, we're going to lose a lot of people when we go in there with the ground force. Oh, you know, I, I was saying this again the, the other day. It's incredible. If, if the choice is what, when he made that speech about not bombing civilian targets, that was a message to Baghdad and Saddam Hussein to take all his missiles and bring them into the population centers, hide them in the mosques, yeah. put them on the roofs of apartment buildings in the heart of Baghdad and Basra. It, it's, it's as bad a comment as Jimmy Carter made in April of 1980 after the taking of hostages, of 450 American hostages, and Carter made a speech saying the most important thing to us is returning those Americans alive. And in, instead of saying publicly that those Americans are, are soldiers and prisoners of war and the United States will take whatever decisive action it needs to, against Iran uh, to ensure the integrity of its people, he said the most important thing is get them back alive. And by saying that, he basically said to Iran that you can use those people as, as puppets for the next year or two. That's right. Well, it's the same thing. The, uh, I guess, who did it to the Israelis? The Palestinians or, uh, were hiding their troops among the civilian populations. And each time the Israelis tried to... Uh, well, then the world came down to them because now they're interfering with the civilian population. All right, and Israel basically said, you don't understand what's going on, screw you. Yeah, well, pretty much. It's a lot easier to ask forgiveness than ask permission. Yes, you know what? The, the best analogy I can talk to about what America once was, in 1906, sometime early in 1906, Lebanon, or the powers in the Mideast way back when, took a group of American Navy people hostage. And Teddy Roosevelt sent an armament, an armada, out there to get those troops. He gave one command to that general. He said, bring me back those troops alive, or those civilian hostages alive, or bring me the head of the guy that took them. And, and, and that's the only policy that is consistent with war. You know, what, what we should be saying, after bombing for two weeks, the President of the United States should not be making a speech tonight about how nice we've been to uh, Iraqi civilian targets. He should be making a speech saying, I will give Iraq and Saddam Hussein 48 hours to surrender or we will vaporize Baghdad on Friday. 
Because you know what? Not only do we have the power to do it, we are the only nation who has used nuclear weapons in battle, and they would not take our statement as a bluff. And then, just like Hussein said he would bomb Israel, which he has done, just like Hussein has said he would set fire to the oil tankers, which he has done, just like Hussein has said he would let oil out into the Gulf, which he has done, we ought to respond in kind. By, you know, just, I'm not saying that we should engage in a massive nuclear strike against Baghdad. I'm, when I say vaporize, I'm talking about some of the newer weapons we have, which have the capacity to level four or five city blocks at a time with one blow. And from what I heard, everybody's uh, abandoned Baghdad anyway. Well, yeah, to a large extent, I've heard that also. But even a step before that, you, you heard about the, uh, how they said they have five, uh, 500,000 mines between our troops and uh, Kuwait. Yeah, of course. I talked about the fact that a hundred, hundreds of years from now, long after we're gone, some shepherd or with a camel is going to be blown to Allah. Right. Well, rather than have our guys... Uh, it you you've got that radio on in the background it's causing an echo there, there's a lot it seems to me that we can do that we haven't done or perhaps the military is has once again overstated our capacity to do what we want done which is where we're taught you know, we, the, the problem of nuclear weaponry in the Mideast is the fallout, which would inevitably impact not only on the Persian Gulf, but all our neighbors there, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Jordan, and other neutrals. But I will tell you this, to believe that Iran is neutral is a bunch of crap. To believe that the United States has total air superiority when 80 Iraqi planes have made it to Iran is a bunch of garbage. And, and for us to fall prey to these, you know, representations that everything's going well, it, it's, it's just deceptive. I mean, every, the point I was just making about Hussein having done every single thing that he said he promised to do, now what do you do when you hear him say yesterday that the war is about to become bloodier and that he has nuclear, chemical, and biological warheads? You just need to make a choice. Do you, do you want our people to die or do you want his people to die? Thank you. That, I've been saying that for weeks. And as terrible as it is, the Iraqi people have to deal with the fact that they've put up with Hussein for 10 years, that they back him, and, and we better make a choice real quick. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. Well, there's uh, another caller that uh, has the enlightened opinion I do. 7.28 a.m. on WFTL, and you see, we have people that are not very patient. I mean, because we had five lines lit about four minutes ago. Well, we had Mike on one on line one, we had Mike one on line two, and what happens is I get into a dialogue with somebody else, and you guys, you're just very impatient. You just hang up. Although maybe you're on your way to work and we don't have one of those. You can always dial star FTO on your mobile phone. You'll get a lot of static, but it'll make you feel better. Anyway, at 28 minutes after 7, it's only 32 minutes till we can call Don Steigman and find out what the Northridge Hospital position is. And like Al Rantel and I were saying the other day about how many great stories fall by the wayside because of this war, my friend James Locke, who's president of the, uh, I think he's president of the Young Lawyers of Broward County, he's defending a case where a woman slipped and fell at Home Depot, and she says she lost her psychic powers as a result of that. And in order to protect uh, her abilities from impacting on the jury, Jim asked for a court order from Judge Marco barring the psychic from influencing the jury and getting into their state of mind before they reach a verdict. So I'd like to get Jim on the line sometime today just to talk about the case because it's just one of those things that has a touch of humor to it that we need, kind of like the girls of the hands-on car wash. I'm going to have uh, them here with owner Dave Sousa and Sherry and another unnamed lady, and they'll be, uh, you know, they'll be doing all sorts of things to my Lexus. And Al Rantel, he'll be on from 10 to noon with Ray Fauntleroy from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Ray will talk about what it means being black from an anti-war perspective. I guess it's different than being white or brown or red. Now, I don't know how, but, you know, every group has to have its say. And it's true. I could not believe it. It's shocking to me. I did not want to believe it. But if you've heard... Who's sorry now if you've heard Among My Souvenirs and Where the Boys Are 
Connie Francis actually in our studio at 1.30 today. Al, I forgive you. The big hit of the day, four to six, Steve Kane with you. Act up, okay. Norm Kent, yeah. <laughs> To us, AM 14, WFTL, Fort Lauderdale. Okay, Sean, thank you for that uh, quick update on FTL, and it is uh, 23 minutes to 8 a.m. We'll take your calls at 733-1400 in Broward, 1-800-874-3454 in Dade and Palm Beach. The questions have been asked, and they need to be answered. Are we headed to a, a little bighorn in the Gulf? There are lots of reasons to believe that perhaps we indeed are. As Americans everywhere, myself included, yourself included, seem to be getting a little frustrated by our uh, willingness to play by the rules of good citizenship in a vicious battle. You know, one of the greater quotes of uh, Vladimir Lenin, and I've read a lot of his books, I studied Sino-Soviet strategy and military warfare in college, and of course, any time a good war breaks out, I like to go back and read as much as I can about war and warfare, and... Uh, Lenin once wrote in his, in his book Iskra, which is, means the spark, the soundest strategy in war is to postpone operations until the moral disintegration of the enemy renders the delivery of the mortal blow possible and easy. So maybe this is what Hussein is saying when he's saying he is laying back, he is not trying to engage the United States in an air war. He realizes that the modern anti-radiation missiles and the basis of our technological defense would so devastate, so devastate his ability to fight an air war that he's, you know, hiding out, and, and as uh, General uh, Powell said yesterday, husbanding his uh, air force in um, the uh, state of Iran, which is, should probably not be considered neutral territory by the United States. Anywhere our enemy is should not be neutral territory. It's that simple. If there are Iraqi planes in an Iranian airport, then bomb those planes and send a check to Iran, okay? I'd rather send a check to Iran for the airport we bombed than have to be paying widower's benefits to housewives in Virginia. And, you know, World War I is the pla first place, and watching all quiet on the Western Front again, uh, World War I is the first place where CW, where chemical weapons were used. And the real purpose, if you've seen our troops don these incredible gas masks and protective gear, what those chemical weapon masks do is reduce your efficiency in hand-to-hand -hand combat, especially in the searing heat of Saudi Arabia. Just think about it. Just think about it. If Iraq launches an attack and their troops know that chemical weapons are in fact not being employed, but we're in, we're in those like desert suits where we have to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, we're, we're going to get bounced around there. So I'll tell you, there's a lot to be worried about. Is there a little bighorn waiting for us? Especially when you hear, especially when you hear Hussein who has promised and done everything he's promised, to use nuclear, chemical, and biological warheads. I'll tell you, GG. 20 minutes to 8 a.m. on the big F, WFTL. GG's coming to drop off list for... Do you need something from Dunkin' Donuts? GG, you're the greatest. Uh, just another cup of tea, giant cup of tea, and maybe a couple of banana nut muffins would be nice. You know, Al, Al comes in, he gets off on those banana nut muffins. And a check for $3,000 for my uh, baseball card store would be terrific. It can be a cashier's check from any local bank. Baseball Heaven, of course, uh, located on East Sunrise Boulevard. We haven't been selling a lot of baseball cards. My friend Greg over at Island Mountain Travel, not selling a lot of cruises. The cruise supermarket this weekend, I heard Saturday that they're giving two-for-one discounts away. Uh, airline companies finding that the tourism business has plummeted. People are canceling their overseas vacation. American Express offices everywhere have become targets for terrorism. And we are worried about not bombing a mosque in Baghdad. Well, let me tell you, folks, 19 minutes to 8 a.m., 
I want, I'm beginning to think that maybe, just, just maybe, we need to get a little bit tougher. I know it sounds, I mean, with 20,000 tons of bombs, we've obviously had a strong effect, but uh, there's more we can do. There's more we can do, and uh, what, now Sally's hung up. What the hell's going on here today? People are calling and hanging up. I know, you know, maybe what I'm doing is saying things they agree with, and they just don't want to regurgitate what I have to say. So I was, you know what I was going to do before the break? I, I almost forgot I was reading the schedule for our guest today. Let's see, we've got 10 to noon, I told you, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference talks about their anti-war perspective, and then at 1.30, believe it or not, believe it or not, what? Believe it or not, believe it or not, the Connie Francis uh, song is not playing. I'm trying to get this up, folks, I really am, but... It looks like the Connie Francis CD is not working. Well, Connie Francis, the singer and actress appearing at Sunrise Musical Theater, will be a guest on the Our Antel Show for 30 minutes, and I was going to play one of her tunes, Everybody's Somebody's Fool. Also, Where the Boys Are, Follow the Boys, I'm Going to Be Warm This Winter, Breaking in a Brand New Broken Heart. Connie's 21 biggest hits available on Polygram Records. She'll be here in our studio, so... Any of you that want uh, Connie's autograph, come by. I'm sure she'll sign for you. 4 p.m. from Cure AIDS Now, a uh, spokesman with Steve Kane, and from ACT UP, the very people that shut down the San Francisco subway system that broke into Dan Rather's studio and that have been giving speeches about fighting AIDS and not Arabs, will be penetrating the airwaves. Once again, a group more interested in its own cause than the cause of the American people at large. Well, don't worry, folks. We're going to put an end to that. Jim Michaels, why didn't that work? You're having you're having your share of mechanical problems. The gate won't open for you. The CD player won't play for you. You're having a good morning. Well, the, the Lexus started up, though, this morning. That makes eight mornings in a row. At 8 o'clock, we're going to go out to the front gate, and we're going to figure out what's wrong. Well, that, that sounds like about uh, as exciting as uh, going to the dentist to get a teeth pulled. Tooth pulled. Tooth pulled. Listen, I got to take these calls because these people are hanging up on me if I don't answer the phone right away. Okay, Jay, it's 17 minutes to 8 a.m. Storm and Norman, I like that. Storm and Norman in the morning. You've had uh, an excellent insight into this whole thing, and I'm sharing what you sharing. Now, talking about technical problems, Jay's just disappeared. Here. Okay, well, you keep on speaking into the phone. It works better that way. Okay, well, I, I can stop. I just want to have on the board there. It may be. You know, you got to realize that uh, the people that run off board are the same people that uh, name their kids after obscure, you know, Indian rocks. The same people who, are, who, are, who fixed the gate for you this morning. Yeah, they're the same people who, you know, chew tobacco on their honeymoon, okay? Yes. Now, what, um, I hear your feelings that uh, I said was here. What do you suppose the, the uh, 90 aircraft or 90 or so aircraft in Iran is going to be there? I think they're going to be arming themselves with chemical weapons to launch a strike against the United States uh, m uh, military ships in the Persian Gulf. Um, I think you got that half right. My true feeling is. Everything this lunatic said he was going to do, spitefully, he announced it before he was going to do it about the oil in the Gulf uh, and etc. Um, he said, and he wants to be a, a hero in the Arab world. That's exactly what you said, but I think that'll be his answer. Well, actually, that, that would not be surprising. and. Now, this may come across wrong, but Israel, with its 750 aircraft, would probably welcome a direct attack. Then there would be no question about the necessity for them getting into the war. And that's how they'll get them into the war. Well, you know, they've got to go almost a thousand miles from uh, uh, Iran to Israel, and I think they'll be met head on. Okay, listen, thanks for your call. We've got to do the uh, all-important commercial break deal.
Okay, now, I've got to tell you, of course, Dolores says I'm not supposed to say we're going to go to a commercial break, and uh, I don't care. I, I feel an obligation to tell you when we are, but most importantly, before I even talk to you about my friends, at, and that was King Paul, the monarch of uh, WFTL, here on the Big F. Eight minutes to 8 a.m., we have some people still patiently waiting. Yuri keeps on calling and hanging up because I guess he's at work or something important. Anyway, uh, Yuri, I, had a, I grew up with a kid named Yuri and Odie, both from Israel. Their birthdays were uh, twins, you know, June 14th. It was back in Kew Gardens, New York, years and years ago. I remember Odie and Yuri, they moved back to Israel. That's what I remember. Let's see, on line three, it's Barbara. Good morning. Good morning. I think people are hanging up because today exactly what's on their mind. But I want to suggest this. When I heard, the, and, and I agree, and I hate people to call it, well, I agree with 100%, but it just happened. Well, you don't really hate them. When General Schwarzkopf said, well, we're going to fight our war, we're not going to fight his war. I remember reading about General Patton. He said, not to get into the mind of your enemy, and you have to know what he's thinking and what he's going to do. Hussein did not go to West Point or the War College, and he's not going to say, well, you, you can't go to chapter three in the book on how to do a war. You bring up to one and two. I, I just don't understand this at all. Listen, here's the deal, and this is what I find so incredibly striking. We're so worried about this coalition, we're letting our only real ally in the neighborhood, Israel, stand by and take 53 direct hits by Scud missiles, because we're worried about this coalition. Exactly. What a joke. Let, I said this from the beginning. That's, that's outrageous. I can just imagine that if they bombed, we're so isolated here. Of course, our, our men are there. We're not isolated. And that's respect. But if they bombed Israel, and they bombed the Jewish community, and they bombed the Jewish community, being given that we were Israel, I can just imagine, oh, okay, we just wait. And I, I, this is a terrible thing for me to say to no. Yeah, I suppose if we really wanted to hurt Iraq, we could send Neil Bush there to open up some SNLs. Well, that, that's going to have to stop. What will happen is Congress, as soon as the, the reality sinks in to the American Congress that this is not a 30-day war, but is a larger battle, they are going to have to spa pass special laws that will provide uh, relief and financial aid to families that have loved ones overseas in combat that will provide for mortgage foreclosure forgiveness and things like that. You can expect that to happen. I, I assure you it will. Let's just hope it happens before people start losing their homes. No, I understand it's already happened. No, it's one thing, you know, to, to go over there, but it's another thing to disrupt families when, when they are doing their duty, when, when they're called. I'm telling you, it's, it's so frustrating. And I think it's just because of the fact that we're so isolated here. Well, I think it's just because of the fact that we're so isolated here. Well, I think it's just because of the fact that we're so isolated here. And after all, we are all in a fight, but we're, we're not in the service. And how come the general public is a rule? And can see all this, and they can't, unless it's what they tell us and what they're doing is propaganda for us and figuring that they're going to monitor it and it's for them to hear. That's the only thing that saves me from absolutely going with me, too. Well, I think what we're doing is, is kind of asinine when we say things like, well, Iran's neutral territory, so as long as Iraq flies its planes there, we won't do anything else. Imagine, imagine what it would have been for Iraqi pilots to hear, instead of General Schwarzkopf saying it's okay for them to go to Iran since they're out of the war and they're going to be impounded. Imagine if the Iraqi pilots or the military command heard there are no places off limits for enemy aircraft. 
Wherever we find them, we will strike and attack them. And if they make the mistake of landing at an Iranian airfield and Iran gives them permission to land, then they put Iran and their aircraft at risk. Imagine if he said that. You, you can't give the enemy sanctuary. You can't say, well, the mosques are off limits, the civilian apartments are off limits, the cities are off limits, Iran is off limits. What the hell isn't off limits? I'm getting upset. I am getting angry. I thought I'd say that. Yeah. Our don't be haven in a war. We've always found our hospital. But I think our reputation has preceded us in, in the fact that you mentioned with our hostages keeping them out. Israel went over and they got their people out and they didn't care how they did it. And, and what did they can do when, when our Marines were devastated in front of our embassy? Now, to me, that yeah, he made he made a speech. Listen, listen, I gotta run. I gotta run for the eight o'clock news. But uh, I'm not saying we have to necessarily go ahead and bomb these civilian targets. But certainly, we shouldn't send a message to our enemies that we have no intention of doing so. You can't do that. I mean, this is the kind people forget what what kind of guy Hussein is like. He used chemical warfare. Not only did he use chemical warfare against Iran, he he used chemical warfare against an Iranian hospital in 1985. You don't know, the Hadrat Fatima Hospital was bombed with mustard gas in 1985, killed 8,600 Iranians. This is the Norm Kent Show on WFTL Armageddon Radio here. We'll be back, and let's see if we can't get a hold of Steigman from Northridge Center after the 8 a.m. news break. Yeah. 8 a.m. CNN News being brought to you by Castro Convertible, the world's largest convertible furniture manufacturer, selling directly...